Well, good morning. My name is Frank. I run the deal and research team at Andreessen. And what that means is I get to see all of the entrepreneurs when they knock on our front door and ask for funding. And so a lot of you have asked me, oh, couldn't I be a fly on the wall in those conversations? So today is exactly that experience for you, which is I've been seeing a ton of AI startups generally uh, and then autonomous startups more specifically. And so I'm going to take you inside the room when we meet with all of these startups and basically share questions that the community is asking about how we're going to get to the fabulous future of when cars drive themselves. Our thesis is actually that everything that moves will eventually go autonomous. So if there's a reason for a plane or a uh, truck or a toy or a shopping cart to move by itself and get from destination A to B, it will because the cost will collapse, and it'll be useful for us. But I want to talk to you about cars today, partly because the market is so ginormous. And so, look, the most valuable tech company on the planet is Apple. It sells phones. That is the orange dot on the far right, which is, that is a ton of revenue, very high gross margin. But look at cars. Much higher revenue, fewer units, but it is a massive, massive market. And I can't wait, personally, until we get to the self-driving car World And so what I want to do is share 16 questions that I hear over and over again when I meet with startups or big companies that are participating in this marketplace. And so I want to share some of them with you. So three categories. We're going to talk about tech. We're going to talk about business. And then we'll talk about social implications of this glorious future. All right. So let's start with technology. Question one I hear all the time is about how will we get to the self-driving future? So the categorization scheme for self-driving cars comes from the Society for Automotive Engineers. The United States has a slightly separate one, but this is an international audience, so let's talk SAE. They have a six-level categorization scheme. Zero is drive it yourself. One is the cars that you and I mostly drive today, which is it's got anti-lock brakes and cruise control, so it'll help you a little. Five all the way is you get into the car, there's no steering wheel. So the only mode of transportation is self-driving mode, and you have no ability to control the car. And so the question is, are we going to get to the future basically from zero to one to two to three, one feature at a time, or will it just, boom, pop out? The car drives itself. You have no choice. There's no steering wheel. So if you are an incumbent, so if there's several auto manufacturers in the room here today, if you're an incumbent, your strategy is probably incremental, which is we're going to get there one feature at a time. That is a GM car. Just took it off their website. It's a $17,000 car. For $2,500, you can add self-driving capabilities, emergency braking, lane keep, uh, adaptive cruise control, right? So let's just keep on adding features, and then eventually we'll sort of forget that we have to drive. Now, if you're Google, uh, on the other hand, you might think, let's just pop in at level four or level five, which is let's take out the steering wheel altogether because the hard thing about having a mixed mode where sometimes the car drives itself and sometimes you drive it is... How do you design that user experience? How do you get the car to say, hey, I'm uncertain about what to do in this situation. You need to take over. And if you look at the accidents that have happened, it's precisely this failure in user experience design that has led to fatal accidents. And so the argument would be, let's avoid all of those hard UX design problems. Let's just go straight to level five. So that's one question I hear a lot. Level five straight, or are we just going to add a feature at a time? Another question that we hear a lot is, what set of sensors will the self-driving car have? And in particular, the one that seems to be most divisive in the uh, ecosystem is whether or not you're going to have LIDAR. So LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. It is, think of it as a laser radar. It builds a very accurate 3D map of the environment so you know exactly what is around you all the way around. If you've seen a self-driving car, the LIDAR is that Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket thing that sits on top of the car and spins. That is a $75,000 piece of equipment. So obviously, if we get to a self-driving future, it's not going to be that thing. That's too expensive. It's too obtrusive. Nobody wants the bucket on their roof. The good news is we're headed rapidly towards making that thing solid state. In other words, no moving parts. It's going from $75,000 to $250. And in that case, why not have LiDAR? The counterargument is that this is yet another sensor that needs to go on the device. And we can get all the benefits of LiDAR with at least stereo cameras which is there's two cameras facing the front, and then you know, because you have two eyes, if you have two cameras facing front, you can actually compute 3D space. You do it all the time. This is why you don't bump into people. So the argument is, look, LiDAR is fantastic and all, but if we can get there with just two cameras, which we know we're going to have anyway, then why go to the expense of LiDAR? Why give the sensor fusion system more input than it it can handle? Now, the counter-argument is that, look, 
the accuracy uh, and the resolution of a LIDAR system, especially if it gets to the prices that people are projecting, just add an element of increased resolution and safety to the system because now we're measuring the 3D world as opposed to computing the 3D world. So that's another question that we hear a lot. Will there be LIDAR or not? Most people that I talk to think definitely LIDAR. There's a couple big outliers. I think Tesla is trying a system without LIDAR, but we'll see. I think uh, once the new low-cost units get into the ecosystem, uh, we might have a different answer. Question three. Will there be new types of pre-computed, let's call them HD maps, that are on board on the cars? So everybody uses Google Maps or Apple Maps or Waze here. And those maps have gotten amazingly good. It'll tell you how to route around a building so you end up at the front door. On the freeways, it'll tell you you want to be in one of the right two lanes, right? And every time they add a new feature like that, you're like, wow, that is just amazing that they've gotten to that level of resolution. But even as amazing as that is, it's not quite enough for a car that wants to drive itself to navigate the world. So what information is missing? What you could put in new HD maps is where are the curbs? Where are the traffic barrels? What time of day am I going to get glared through the front windshield so maybe I need to trust my cameras a little less because they're going to have a hard time figuring out what's actually in front of me? So that type of information isn't in Google Maps because Google Maps is for people. So we might need a separate type of map that is for the autonomous driving algorithms. That's what we're talking about here, which is will the cars need these pre-computed HD maps that allow the algorithms to have more confidence about what the right behavior is in any given situation. Now, the counterargument here is that, look, if we need these HD maps, who's going to provide them, right? There's three mapping companies left on the planet. And what cost will that generate? And will that limit where the car can go? So let's imagine for sake of argument that you have a self-driving car. Without one of these maps, it doesn't know how to drive or it can only drive very slowly. Or it needs you to drive. That obviously limits the applicability of a car, right? It's kind of how we think of electric cars today, right? Limited by range. So we might have a situation in which self-driving cars are limited by the availability of HD maps if we're not able to calculate all these things. Obviously, it'd be better if we could calculate all of these things on the fly without requiring one of these maps. In other words, I could figure out the speed limit. I could figure out the flow of track. It. I could figure out where the curbs were just by driving by. Obviously, that requires a higher computational load. So the supercomputer that's going in the trunk of your car needs to be even more super. And that has range implications if you're building an electric vehicle. It has gas mileage implications if you're building a gas-powered vehicle, right? So we've got CAFE to worry about. So the question here is, what is the power envelope that I'm going to allow this supercomputer in my trunk? Am I going to allow 50 watts, 100 watts, 250 watts, 500 watts? The more watts I give it, the more it can compute this stuff, but obviously the more of a drag on range it is. So question three, will we need these HD maps to have the cars go? Question four. What blend of software techniques will we use? The red-hot center of Silicon Valley right now is artificial intelligence, and in particular, a series of artificial intelligence techniques called deep learning. NVIDIA would have you believe that the path to get to a self-driving car is basically deep learning end-to-end. -end. What comes in as input is basically the sensor data, camera data, LIDAR data, accelerometer data, GPS data. And then what comes out as outputs is basically what is the correct driving technique to use, right? So think of the three inputs you have to your car as a human driver is how much you spin the steering wheel, how much you push on the gas, or how much you push on the brakes, right? Those are the three inputs. And so the argument is like we can use deep learning to basically connect those inputs and outputs. In comes the sensor data, out comes the right steering wheel position, brake and throttle position. If you are involved in the industry today, you think, hmm, Look, we've invented over the 30 years uh, of robotic controls through control systems a set of algorithms that don't rely on deep learning. They're not training uh, neural nets. They are using techniques like search, directed search, to figure out what is a safe path. Robots have been doing this for years, ever since we had Shaky wandering around the hallways of SRI in the 60s. And so the argument is, look, let's not throw away all of the techniques we've invented to figure out how robots can maneuver in the natural world, and we're going to bring these techniques together rather than rely on deep learning end-to-end. -end. And there are a whole set of computer algorithms that basically can guarantee vehicle control, can do correct motion planning, can calculate the right path to take, what happens when the bus in front of you stops, can you go or not, what happens when you hear an emergency vehicle, what's the correct behavior. 
You could imagine that being trained end-to-end -end deep learning style, in which case you'd have to expose the car to tons of situations where there's ambulances and fire engines. You could also imagine just programming those as rules. And so I think we're going to see some blend of these techniques, but it's a tribute to the power of deep learning and how effective those techniques that we're even having this conversation that you could build an end-to-end -end deep learning car. Another question. So if deep learning is going to be so important, the way these deep learning algorithms work is you expose them to data and they predict the correct behavior. So you need a ton of data. So the question is, how much of the data that we're going to use is going to be from real cars driving on real roads versus getting that data in virtual reality? So let me show you what this will look like. Imagine that you could train the same deep learning algorithms not by driving real cars on real roads, but basically in a gaming engine simulating the real world. Could you get the neural nets to converge to the same weights, in other words, make the same predictions, as you could if you had driven them on a real road? The advantages of this are obvious. You can devote a lot of computers to this. You can simulate a lot more situations, rain, snow, fog, light. The question is, if when we ship our self-driving cars, all of them have been trained by, call it 10 million miles of driving, how many of those 10 million miles are on actual physical roads versus how many of them are in something like Grand Theft Auto? So that's a question that we hear all the time. Next question. Will V to X radios play an important role in self-driving cars? How many people have heard of V to X radios? Okay, not that many. V to X is an acronym because the car industry loves acronyms. It stands for V to X, where X is a variable. V to V, vehicle to vehicle radios, where your car could have a conversation with another car. And V to I, where your car can have a conversation with the road or the traffic light. Now, how many times have you sat at a traffic light? It just turns red when you're there. There's nobody else around, and you're sitting there for three minutes. Like, it's infuriating, right? There, there's no reason you should be sitting there. The traffic like it ought to see you, or you ought to have a conversation, and it ought to realize there are no other cars around. Just go. Uh, so that would be the benefit of V to I communication. You can actually talk to the traffic light. The traffic light could compute what other cars are waiting for um, uh, uh, the green signal. Oh, no other cars. Just go. Another great use case for V to X radios would be the uh, T-boning crash problem. All right, so here's the T-boning clash problem. Imagine that you're going straight. There's another car that has lost control of its brakes, and it's coming down the road 40 miles an hour. And if you inch out into the intersection, it will T-bone you. Problem is, it's hidden behind a skyscraper. There's a tall building that obscures your view. So the cameras don't see it. The LIDARs don't see it. The radars don't see it. The ultrasonic doesn't see it. Nothing sees it. What will save you in that case, if the car can have a conversation with your car and say, I'm going to be in the same space as you, if you inch forward, don't inch forward. So that would be a great outcome. Uh, Mercedes-Benz has started putting V to V radios in their S series. I think that comes uh, 2019, maybe a little earlier. So now all the S classes can talk to each other. That's great if you own an S class. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the problem with V to X, right? You have, a, you have a deployment problem. You also have a protocol compatibility problem, which is who makes the radios? How do we guarantee the compatibility? And these decisions need to make in split seconds. So if it's as slow as your phone finding an LTE tower to talk to, right, which takes on order seconds, that's not going to work, right? Seconds go by, you've been T-boned. So obviously, uh, would be great. Uh, most people I talk to say, look, this is a wonderful future. And when we all have radios that can talk to each other, that's fantastic. Let's put aside the security concerns for a second, because there's going to be some pretty fabulous spoofing that comes uh, along with this technology. But I'm not going to depend for my first model year on V to X being widely deployed. It's a great night to have. One more technology question. This one's fun. When will we be able to take out traffic lights? So if the roads are filled with cars that are autonomous, this is going to seem very quaint. This will be like one of those things Ben explained about how the past sucked. Four-way lights suck, right? Instead, if the cars can talk to each other, let me show you what doesn't suck. This is research from the University of Texas Autonomous Lab. If the cars can talk to each other, and if the intersections can smartly arrange traffic like this, let's treat cars like packets, the algorithms can guarantee no accidents, this doesn't suck. Now look, I don't want to be the first guy in a car that goes through one of these intersections. <laughs> but once it works, I would love this. This is just fun. So can we get rid of traffic lights? 
Oh, I got one more technical question. All right. So here's the question. You all know, because you come from different places in the world, that every city has different driving culture. What's safe in Bangalore would be suicidal in Boston. What's safe in Boston is safe nowhere else in the United States. <laughs> so here's the question. We used to have this concept in computer science called localization, which is the process of preparing your software to be used in another country that doesn't speak your language, right? So you had script, you had date formats, you had... So the new localization will be autonomous cars. Will car manufacturers ship the Boston version, the Bangalore version, the Budapest version, and it's pre-programmed to go in that city because it understands driving conventions of that city? Or will there be one car that ships and then they get localized through, call it the first month of driving in that city, and they can learn the driving conventions of that city? So let me show you some Stanford research that gives you a hint of what it might mean to automatically train the car to understand the driving conventions in your city. Most of the people think about robots uh, as, uh, as those that are used in industrial settings. Uh, or they think about robots in, uh, in autonomous driving scenarios. Uh, so we're envisioning a, a new generation of robots which uh, can work, uh, can operate alongside humans. Uh, for instance, in uh, shopping malls, in train stations. In order to do so, social robots has to be understand uh, human conventions, human uh, etiquette. We actually don't have those rules uh, written down. Our goal in this project is to actually learn uh, those rules automatically from observations by seeing, by observing how humans uh, behave in these kind of social spaces. And uh, the idea is to transfer those rules into robots. And machine learning technique is basically a machine that will learn from the data to reproduce a given output. We are collecting images and video from this scene and we need to transform these images into coordinates of human in the same space. So we go from image to coordinates. Now from this coordinate we can train an algorithm, we can design an algorithm. By learning social uh, conventions the robot can be part of ecosystems where humans and robots coexist. We actually uh, envision the idea of having robots that can be uh, as uh, lovable and amicable as possible and, uh, and therefore they don't need to necessarily look like humans. <laughs> Having that in mind, we designed a, a robot called Jack Robot. Instead of looking uh, like a humanoid, it's, uh, it looks more like a ball on wheels. Jack Rabbit is coming from the animal, the Jack Rabbit animal that moves around very fast. You have this animal on campus, on Stanford campus. Now Jack Rabbit has a set of sensors to be able to perceive, to understand uh, its surrounding. Okay. So right now we are uh, controlling Jack Rabbit with a joystick for the purpose of uh, this demo. But we have developed this algorithm that is able to automatically move the robot. And in the next generation we're going to uh, integrate that. So even if the current model is rather expensive, we believe that in an order of five, uh, six, seven years, we can, uh, it's possible to make these robots uh, affordable uh, and enable uh, eventually companies to release those robots uh, to the mass market. And the cost will be something as cheap as 500 bucks. So that gives you a sense of how we might actually train cars after you get them to understand local conventions. How do pedestrians move? What's the safe uh, stopping distance? How closely do you tailgate somebody? And so the car manufacturers wouldn't have to create 300 versions, one for each city. They would ship it with learning algorithms that could learn the driving conventions of that city. So that's the sweep of technical questions that we hear all the time. I want to switch gears and let's talk about business questions. What changes in the way money moves hands when we have self-driving cars? So one question that we get asked a lot is, who is going to win? The obvious bet here would be to make a bet on the incumbents, which is the people who already make cars, which is already hugely technically demanding, capital hungry. They'll just be able to get there with enough features and software. And if you look at the incumbents, the list of incumbents who have offices in Silicon Valley because they understand that software is going to drive this is very long. So within 25 miles of our office in Menlo Park, we've got Baidu, Ford, Next EV, Leico, Future Mobility Corp, VM Motor, Lucid Motors, BYD, Tesla, Nissan, BMW, GM, Toyota, Mercedes. These are all people with offices in Silicon Valley trying to hire software talent to drive 
no pun intended, to autonomous vehicles. So there's one bet, probably the safe bet, is the incumbents will just get there. Another counter bet would be that it's going to be a native Silicon Valley company that just from whole cloth invents a car, gives it propulsion, and then gives it autonomous vehicle, right? The obvious bet here to make would be on Tesla to get there. And then to keep an eye on is the list of Chinese manufacturers who uh, are very aggressively pursuing this space. By the way, uh, China published more deep learning papers than any other country on the planet. Definitely worth keeping an eye on uh, is the Chinese manufacturers, either manufacturers or software proprietors like Baidu. So unclear how it will shape up, but there's a big battle royale coming. Another question on the business side is, will we as consumers continue to buy cars directly from the manufacturers, or will we just buy transportation as a service? And if we just buy transportation as a service, in other words, our brand loyalties drift to companies like Lyft and Uber and away from companies like GM and BMW, this is a seismic shift in the industry, which is car ownership no longer becomes a must-have for modern society. It becomes something that you rent. And if this happens, then the auto industry ends up looking a lot more like the airline industry. When you all booked your flights to Vegas, you didn't really pick aircraft. I mean, there are airplane nerds who will say, yeah, I'm not taking that flight because I only fly Airbus, but there's not that many. Your loyalty is to your carrier. And if that happens, then the car companies become B2B providers, just like Boeing and Airbus. They sell to fleet managers, and your consumer loyalty is to the fleet provider, not to the car manufacturer. And so thousands of things would change if car companies didn't market directly to consumers. We wouldn't see Super Bowl ads for cars because why would you, right? The, the, the sound that the car door makes when you slam it shut, right? That is an engineered sound to make you feel like, mm, that's my car. Who cares if it's a fleet operated thing, right? So millions of things would change if we migrate from transportation as a service being the primary consumer decision as opposed to I'm buying a car and I have brand loyalty to a car maker. Powell insurance change. Today, insurance is calculated, insurance prices, auto insurance prices are calculated as a function of you as a driver, and they get all your demographic information to try to figure out how reckless a driver you're going to be, and the cost of the cars that you own, right? So those are the primary determinants uh, and where you live. So those are the three primary ingredients that go into calculating insurance rates. In a self-driving world, eventually there will be no drivers, and so like your demographics are irrelevant. So your premium prices might become solely a function of how effective the autonomous algorithms are. Who's the safest? Maybe Ford is the safest, and so it has the lowest rates. Maybe Tesla's the safest, and it has the lowest rates. And then here's a thought experiment to do. Imagine this future world. Somebody rolls up to your house, hacks your garage door opener. Your garage door rolls up. Then it hacks your Tesla and drives a Tesla home. Okay? Who's liable in that case? The garage door maker, because it was so easy to hack? Your homeowner's insurance because you didn't have intrusion detection and prevention at your house. The car manufacturer because it was so easy to hack. So all new questions will come up about who is liable for these events when the cars can drive themselves. Another question is, will repair costs go up or down? We're pretty confident that when we get to a fully autonomous fleet, we'll have fewer accidents. But maybe the cost of repair will go up because, yeah, we got to repair that supercomputer in your trunk that figured out how to drive on the road. So big questions coming up, insurance. Let me ask social questions as we round home. All right. So first social question is, how will accident rates change? What you're looking at here is a graph of fatalities over time. That is the green graph, and it's divided by the total number of vehicle miles traveled, the MT. And as you've seen, we've gone on a rapid decline in the number of fatalities over time as we've driven more and more as a culture. It's a testament to the car industry, the training of automobile drivers, that we've driven this number down. It's ticked up recently. You can see this little blip. You can't really see it in the green graph, but if you'd extended the line, you'd see a little blip uh, It's going up just a tiny bit. You might blame cell phones, but nobody's done the study yet, distracted driving. But the question is, look, what happens when we have self-driving cars? I think we're all confident in a future in which if it was all autonomous, the accident rates would be very close to zero because if you actually look at the top 25 causes of accidents, 24 out of the 25 are human driver error related. It's distracted driving, it's speeding, it's drunk driving, it's reckless driving, it's running red lights. It's, right? So if you're interested, I'll send you the URL. 24 out of 25 of the reasons that fatal accidents happen is driver error. So we're pretty sure that the algorithms will be better than this. 
In the short term, though, when we don't have full autonomous and we have a mix of self-driving and human drivers, the accident rate might actually go up. And if you look at the Google car accidents, and they're very transparent in their reporting, most of them are these sort of Google driver with a human driver combos, right, where you're kind of waiting for the Google car to turn right, but it never turns right because it's trying to be safe and you kind of rear end it because you were kind of expecting it to go like a human driver, and it didn't. So you might expect a little tick up in rates. I would argue that even if we have a little tick up in rates on accidents, that we should go full speed to letting the autonomous cars on the road because I have every confidence that the learning curve for autonomous cars will be better than the learning curve for every individual human driver. I have a 16-year-old, just got his license. Woo! <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'll bet algorithms over that guy any day, and I love my son. Morally, from a social point of view, we should try to get self-driving cars on the road as soon as possible, even if we get this small tick up in new types of accidents that we've never seen before due to the interaction, because the self-driving algorithms will get better, and we've got to get the number of fatalities to go to zero. All right, a couple more questions. This one's fun. When will it become illegal to drive? So if it were true that the algorithms are demonstrably, measurably, statistically better than a human driver, then we should not let human drivers on the roads. And so if you wanted to go drive, then go to Legoland. I can't wait. Now, I know there's a lot of drivers who love to drive. And driving can be a fun recreational activity. We just don't need you on the road. I know the drivers hate me for that. Another question. How will commute times change? So one argument that you can make is that commute times will get longer because you've become indifferent to how long your commute is. So now that I have a 16-year-old who can drive, and he can drive me to his grandparents' house, my mom's house, I don't care how often we go. Let's go twice a week. It's autonomous to me, right? I don't have to pay any attention. And so the argument would be, look, we're going to extend our commute time because all of a sudden I've become indifferent to how long my commute time is. The counterargument is that imagine all of the space that we could free up in our cities if we had autonomous cars, parking spots, auto repair shops, well, it could be SimCity-like and put all their auto repair shops in a city and the cars could drive to it. I don't care. So the argument would be we can free up our city spaces so that people can live closer to the jobs and commute times will go down. Don't know how that will turn out, but it is definitely a question that we're keeping an eye on. This is commute times over time. You see it's a straight up and to the right. Every new commute modality, like when we introduce highways, commute times increase. You would have thought the opposite. But economists explain this as induced or latent demand, which is when you add freeway miles, you just get more drivers. Congestion doesn't go down. All right, two last questions. So when you saw the first mass-manufactured automobile, it was very easy to predict that everybody would own a car. It was cheap enough for design that price so that the average person could afford a car. What was hard to predict was Walmart. So think about the sequence of social decisions that led from us owning cars to a super center in your neighborhood. And with autonomous cars, we're also going to have second and third order effects that are very difficult to predict now. We all know that it'd be awesome to have a self-driving car, but what kind of new social things like Walmart will happen? Not easy to tell. All right. And to bring it all home is when will this beautiful world happen? So I'm just going to read off the list of public estimates that the major players have made about when we'll start seeing autonomous cars. Newtonomy says 2018. They're live in Singapore, top 10 cities by 2020. Delphi and Mobileye say they'll have self-driving systems available to the car manufacturers by 2019. Volkswagen and Baidu says there will already be systems on the planet. 2020, GM says that's when it will have its cars Ford says 2021, they'll have level five cars available to fleet makers. BMW ships the iNext in 2021. Tesla, who's arguably out ahead of this right now, says 2023. Uber says that its entire fleet will be autonomous by 2030. And the IEEE says that by 2040, 40% of all cars on the road are autonomous. So you see quite a range of predictions on when this glorious future happens. And then once it starts, we don't know what the demand curve will be. And obviously, this has implications for how we finance companies participating in this space, depending on the uh, adoption scenario. But look, it's going to happen in our lifetime, which is probably not something that I would have predicted 10 years ago. And I can't wait for life not to suck in this brand new way. Look forward to working with all of you to make this glorious future happen as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you.